Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of Unfiltered Truth. We'll have these recordings posted on my YouTube channel every other week. We'll determine that at a later date. But for now, we'll be sharing our stories. So we'll get immigrants on this channel to talk about their different stories and how things went wrong, but how it went good, just for perspective so you know exactly what you're getting yourself into when you decide to journey to Canada. So today I have my friend and business partner here, Andriana Gill. Andriana too came here as an international student and now she's a Canadian citizen. But before <laughs> that, she had a lot of bumps in the road and we'll talk about that here. So stay tuned. Welcome to Unfiltered Truth journey of canadian immigrants join us every other week where we talk to a new person about their adventure in canada are you interested in coming then this is for you and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the post notification bell so that you are reminded every time that we post these intriguing stories so andrea tell us about i guess start from the beginning how you ended up here how you've heard about canada and how your journey started Okay, so I heard about Canada through my sister-in-law. She heard about Canada through a friend. And also, while I was in university, I met someone who was recruiting students for Canada. And so I, I became very interested. A funny thing, though, school was not my preferred choice. <laughs> like most of us. Yes, so school was not my preferred choice. But what I wanted to do, my mother did not support that, right? Um, it was nothing illegal. I wanted to come as the caregiver. I think that was a yes. program that was happening at the time. And my mommy was not having it. So <laughs> so um, after I completed university, I said, okay, all right, all right. I'm going to just um, focus on school. And so I applied mm -hmm. and my application um, acceptance came in the mail. That's, oh. all, that's how long it was. Hey, yes. That was way back when. So there was no GC key. It no. was in the mail. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, so when I got my acceptance from the college, it came in the mail, a huge brown envelope. I was so excited, open it, and um, you have been accepted, blah, 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 excitement, excitement. I then um, contacted an in-country representative at the time for the college that I applied to, and I met with her to do my study permit application. So she was just um, providing guidance for the whole application process. And I remember when I met with her, she said to me, I don't think you have a strong application because you just completed university and i'm like what is she saying why is she discouraging me right anyhow um at the time i said that cannot be it i just canceled that and i sat in her office and i asked her for a piece of paper i said you know um you may be saying that but i'm going to write a letter at that time i knew nothing about letter of explanation um, so I wrote my letter of um, explanation by I hand did. and yes, and submitted it with my application. No, at the time when I submitted my application, there was no back office then. So I had to get a DHL envelope, put everything that I was submitting for my application, print all the papers, all the bank proof and everything, mm. all the fund, proof of funds and everything, letters, whatever, and put it in the envelope and drop it off at the embassy. Mm. And and um and give it to the security. So you didn't meet anybody in the embassy. Right. You gave it to the security. You didn't get a um tracking number or anything of that sort. Back in the day. <laughs> However, you could include a return envelope. And so that's how I got my passport back with my visa and a study permit um approval letter. Which school was it? Which school did it? It was Okanagan College in um Kelowna, British Columbia. When I got my visa back, I resigned my job. <laughs> exciting times ahead <laughs> and then i uh i started my planning to move to canada that's how my story started and i came here my sister was already here she came a year before me and my sister-in-law so i had people here like what's that was preparing for me pick me up at the airport you know help me with mm -hmm. um you know navigate the whole school system and everything so i had uh, that help okay so you had transitional here. support so it wasn't yes it wasn't too bad but let's fast forward now, getting into school, was it a one-year program, two-year program? How was your program? How did that set up? So I did a two-year business admin program. It was a two-year diploma and it was business administration. Yeah. What was your degree in? My degree was in business education. 
So back home, I was a trained teacher. Okay. In All right. Education. I applied um, for the business admin diploma and um, I was able to get some credits transferred from my business education degree because my business education degree has a component of teaching and business ad. But I did not specialize in business administration. I did teaching um, for right. my speciality. So then got to Canada, your two years program, you got exempt from some courses. What did that look like for you? Because now you are exempt. And we all know that as international students, we need to maintain a full time. Full time. <laughs> How did that work for you? Did you do more courses? Did you end up finishing earlier? How did that look for you, that setup? Okay, so when I came here and I found out that I was able to transfer credits like calculus, when I came here, I, there was a math math component to my um or requirement to my course. And so I, I said, I'm not doing any more math. I did calculus. I did calculus one and calc two and I did all these math courses. So that's when I found out that I could um transfer my credits, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I um submitted, you have to apply to get it done. So you have to speak to an education consultant. And then they will go through the whole process of applying to the college that you're um, attending. So the business college to ensure that your credits are accepted. So I had to request um course outline from the school that I, the university that I attended. Um, so that included uh, me calling the university and requesting an outline. I was able to use that along with my transcript to mm -hmm. get exempted from a few courses. Diploma, I believe um, you have to do 25 courses for a diploma here or 20 courses. I only ended up doing 10 courses because I got so you didn't a lot of courses. the amount. Yes. However, I, I stretched that over the two-year period because I was of the knowledge that if I do a two-year course, as, as I was told, I would get a three-year postgraduate post work permit. permit. Right. So I found out a few things that I could do to remain a full-time student while carrying that um for the let the course load that was less than the required amount. But tell us about it, because I'm <laughs> sure people are watching and would like to do that, especially university graduates that they're doing this coming to school as a means to an end. And of course, we all want our credits to be able to transfer, but we know that we need that postgrad work permit. And we'll get down into the story a little bit, but tell us how you kind of navigate initially, knowing that you have half the course, which means that's what 10 courses versus 20, and it's four semesters. So you have like two to three um courses per semester, which is unheard of. So what was the jig? Okay, so to be considered a full-time student, um, you need to do minimum three courses, maximum five. Mm -hmm. Now, if your intention is to complete your course within the um, two-year timeline that you sign up for, then you have to do five courses per semester. Mm -hmm. However, um, what I did um, when I came to the college, I learned of the co-op program through orientation. I think my sister-in-law knew of it too. So I learned, I learned about it. And there was an office that deals with that alone. So mm -hmm. I went in and I signed up for it. So the co-op work permit is free. Right. So I signed up for it. It's free, but I had to pay the college every semester, about $300. Yeah. All right. So when you are doing co-op, it's considered um, a, a, course, a course, which is three credits, right? And so I was able to carry co-op for two semesters. Okay. So the first semester, you did enough courses. You had enough courses, about four mm -hmm. or whatever. But moving yeah, three, forward, three courses for my first semester. But moving three courses. Forward, you would have been short. So that's where yeah. I, you take up the co-op. Fall semester, I did three courses. Um, winter now, I did two courses plus co-op. And I was still considered a full-time student. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's how I was able to, you know, stretch out my courses that I had to do and still continue to remain a full-time student. All right. We learned something today, guys. So if you want to transfer credit, it is possible. However, make sure that you have enough credits to remain a full-time student because if you, it's a requirement for your postgrad work permit. And if you don't meet the requirement as a full-time student, what it means for you, your postgrad work permit might be issues. So now, Andriana, we finally mm -hmm. we we figured it out, and we're like, yeah, we are full time. We figured it out. We're not doing twenty courses, which means it's cheaper, um, less time consuming, and everything. Uh, right. So now you graduate, and your mommy's like, yes, Andriana done school. <laughs> now. 
You can stop spend panar, everything. But so now you mommy, have... mommy only paid for my first semester. You see, girl, I have money. <laughs> you know, okay, so this is very important to know. So if you are coming here and you there's a co op um, component to your course, yeah. get on it. Right? Yeah. What it does, it exposes you to um the whole work Canada work um system as well as it as it gives you an opportunity to have a job after you're done. So that was the case with me. So I, I started co-op two semesters and after I was done, they approached me and asked me if I could stay on full time. Right. And so full time means I worked with them for what? Five years after. Mm -hmm. And you see the thing with <clears throat> co-op as well. Co-op and work placement is very good because like you see, you get that put in. Yeah. Resume. So even if they don't keep you on, like you have it on your resume. That's your Yes. It yes. And it was and most core most core positions are skill positions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you right. need that in order to to secure. For most people, they do need that to secure their pair after they're done studying. So mm -hmm. um, I was able to get that skill work experience. Um, there is something else I can share <laughs> that you need to also be careful. Everything that happens, there is always a little gray area. <laughs> And you have to be very careful because if you're only doing a course for two two years, four semesters, um, you're only allowed to do co-op for two semesters out of that, right? Right. Or one, half of the time, right? fifty percent of the time. Yeah, yeah. And um, and my co-op extended beyond that. All right, Adriana, you're running the system, right? So now we need to figure out because she's a citizen, you know, guys. So it eventually worked out, but I'm sure. There is some glitches in the story. So now yes. that you finish, and it's time for you to apply for your postgrad work permit. We, mm -hmm. we the viewers and listening to your story, we are of the impression that you're good to go. There's no issues with your postgrad work permit because you are always a full time student. Um, it's a two year program, so you're supposed to get a three years work permit. Tell us how that went. So you submitted the application, and then. Okay, so you use a word there that is very important to note. It's not supposed, you're not supposed to get anything, all right? You may get three years. So I was of the knowledge, like most people, that after you do a two year, so two year means you go to um, school for four semesters. And when I'm done, I'll get my postgrad for three years. But I was taken aback when I submitted my documentation because your girl do a research and your girl do everything. And, you know, I think I thought... I was doing everything right, right? Um, so when I submitted an application, I got a work permit for one year. One year. A postgraduate. One year. One year. So now you got the job through co-op. You in the job, but you literally only have one year to work. So what that means is, so I'm, I'm now employed full-time with the company that I was doing co-op with when I was getting ready to do my PR express entry was just being introduced and so usually you'd have to get your employer to sponsor you now my employer is one of those big companies here in Canada and they were very iffy about sponsoring sponsorship right um as many are because they are not aware or maybe they don't have enough information anyways my manager at the time wanted me to stay on with him so badly. So he said he would do it. Anyways, I applied for the the, the postgrad. I only got one year. And I cried, I cried, I cried. Because my sister applied, got three years. My sister-in-law applied, got three years. So everybody gets in three years. Why? Why me? Anyways, <laughs> so I, 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 I wrote back. At the time, I did not know what to do. So I did some more research. I realized that I could raise a, a web form and request a reconsideration. And that's what I did, right? Mm -hmm. um, I submitted a, my web form, requested a reconsideration, and they did reconsider and gave me two years. <laughs> so, so now I, you have three. You officially have three years. Oh, no, no, no. no. <clears throat> they gave me one year initially. And then two and I wrote back. No, they gave me another year. Oh, so you only got two years. Yes. So in between writing for the appeal, so you, you have to appeal and you know the immigration. The reconsideration. The reconsideration. Was your permit still valid? Your SIN number still valid? Or yes, I got the, the one year work permit and a ball, ball, ball. Anyways, catch up myself. 
reapply, not reapply, but um, submit a um, a reconsideration request through a web form. They did um, accept it, and I was still in status. I still had that one year um, with an additional year. I did not, I did not start my sponsorship pro, um, process or anything. And um, I realized it was getting serious, so I asked my, I told my manager, I said, I can't stay with you unless you can sponsor me. He didn't know what that means, but he said, I will do it because I want you to stay on board with me, right? Um, he started the process and um, head office for the company I was working at got wind of that information that he was sponsoring me, right? He did not know that head office had to be a part of the whole process because mm. I needed documentation from head office, right? And head office took over my application. So now I have my one year that I got initially was expiring and I have an additional year. Head office took over my application and sat on it for almost the one year that I had left on the other permits. When they decided to give me the information that I need, I only had maybe a month or so left on my permit. I went through BC Provincial nominee as an international graduate. And when I submitted my application, um, just before expiration, about a month after I was out of um, status. You're on implied status because you submitted. Exactly. So I, I, I was on implied status. Now, my husband then, uh, my husband was um, back then, came up on the same. So I got my postgrad work permit and he got his um, open work permit. Right. And so yeah. everything for him expired as well. And his um, company was not going to put, keep, him on, keep him on implied status. So he had to stop working. And um, so that's where the cookie started crumbling for right. us. Um, I was on implied, implied status at my um, organization and he was not working. Mm -hmm. And um, it was tough. It was a really, really tough time. Really, really. I've never experienced such tough mm -hmm. times, but that was um, an eye opener for me. But I spoke to somebody, actually my manager that I worked with at the time, connected me with a lawyer, sat with him for 30 minutes. It cost us 500 and something dollars. My manager paid it though. When I worked with them, I realized quick that um, you have to make yourself valuable. If you're not valuable, you're disposable, right? And so for me, I just acquired tons and tons of knowledge and made myself so valuable. That, uh, yes. So... Because of the value I was adding, they did not want to lose me. You know, there's like this common misconception where people would say um, the real Canadians are not really nice and they're, they're hypocrites and so forth. Not saying that I wouldn't put everybody in one bag is, is the point yeah. I'm making with your story. So everybody is not the same. And I have similar situations where I have people at work that have been so nice to me and they're Canadians. But that's just going to show that not everybody is mean and not nice because look at your boss. The mere fact that he paid for a lawyer, he sourced a lawyer and everything just goes to show that you have really nice Canadians here and you have people that will have your back when, you know, the going gets tough. You just have to find those kind of people. That's true. But also don't come here with an expectation that everybody is, nobody is obligated to treat you any certain way. So you come here, you show respect, you ensure that you do what you have to do. So going back to the story now, so the, 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 the manager was so helpful. And so head office, your husband is out, but you are good to go. Good to go one, head office was on my back. So even though I'm on implied status and I was able to print off whatever I need to send to them and say, this is what is happening. This is what I um I submitted and blah, blah, blah. They were still on me because they too have to, you know, rules and regulations that they have to uphold, right? So they were on me a lot from in head office, even though I was on implied status. That application was not like an extra entry application. That was a nomination application that you had submitted. Provincial nomination, yeah. How long did it take to process it? So I submitted the nomination, I want to say July, somewhere there about, because my permit expired a month after. So my permit expired August 4th on my birthday um, in 2015 or 2016. The nomination, I think it took about three to four months. Let us let us backtrack. Um, Went to the lawyer, spoke to the lawyer. And um, yeah, the lawyer was going to, you know, wanted to, to he advised me on, on things that I could do. Um, and he said he would, you know, he could take over and, and do it for me. But I, at the time I didn't have the money and I did not, you know, want to put too much pressure on my boss. So I said, you know, I'm going to do my research. 
And um, so my lawyer did tell me, though, that I needed to submit a postgrad work permit extension. You cannot get that. But he says, submit it nonetheless. Mm. Right? To, to, to save time, because it's going to be a refusal. And keep me on implied status. But it will keep you on implied status. So to, even to save three months, you have three months to... Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, and for my husband, I had to restore his status. So I had to apply for status restoration for him and um, a open work permit. And my uh, my application was a bridging open work permit that I was doing. Right. So you can get a bridging open work permit when you have an application in process. So that was how that played out for me. Um, I um I got so I sent those documents via snail mail, which is just regular post, no registration, nothing. So no um tracking anything. Snail Find mail. Time again. Yeah. So that snail mail bought me some time. Sent it via snail mail. After that, I waited. I waited on the nomination, and I got the nomination. And shortly after, I think it was a Christmas or a January or a New Year. My husband got a work permit and my husband, because that application that I submitted via snail mail, he wasn't eligible to get um, anything. He could at least restore his status back to a visitor, but I asked for his status to be restored back to a worker. And by the time they got to that application, my nomination was yeah. approved. Yes. And then once that came through, immediately after I started, at the time I used um, Express Entry, like the first year Express Entry came out. So I submitted my PR application through Express Entry with that nomination. Okay. And so my husband um, got a open work permit. And when we got the open work permit, I didn't get anything yet. But when my husband got his open work permit at the bottom of the open work permit in the notes section, I saw that first stage of PR has been approved. Oh, okay. So that's great. Like, I never knew that this is something new I'm learning. I never knew they would, like, give you, like, a hint to say. Because I know for persons that apply for, like, the Atlantic or the rural, once they submit, they can also apply for their work permit to come to Canada before they get that approval. I know people So, that yes. For the Atlantic Immigration Program, once you get that um, approval for the job offer, then you have the option to apply for a temporary work permit and you can start working. However, you need to submit your PR application three months after or 90 days, right? Okay. Within 90 days. Great. You ended up getting it. You guys are okay now and settled. So that is the silver lining behind all of that up and down. But now that we know your story, is there anything else about the story that you think would be important for us to know? Because I'm going to switch gear a little bit to get your feedback about, you know, general life in Canada. First thing first to note, when you're coming or you're choosing your program, while you're studying, you must maintain the conditions of your study permit. You can come and you you think that you're doing everything according to the book. But then like me, at the end, I realized that I was not doing everything according to the book. So um, it's very important that if you don't understand, you seek out professional help to ensure that you're maintaining your full-time status as a student. And um, if you're not allowed to work more than 20 hours, ensure sure that you're not doing that because that is going to come back and affect your postgraduate work permit. So it's just um, very, very, very important that you have your plan in place. So you're coming to do a certain course, figure out or find out if the course has a co-op, co-op component, how it works, how much time you are required to do that co-op. Um, for me, as an international graduate through the BC Provincial Nominee Stream, there is a section in it that specifically states that you are not supposed to do more than a certain amount of time on co-op. If you do it, you're not eligible. Yeah, um, I think it's 50 percent because Ontario also has the same stream, BC. Yes. And I guess this is just a side note is that you should not only plan for the Canadian experience class, but plan for different nominations and different programs and be very Please, much yeah. that not all provinces do it. Canada is not just one joint. Provinces differ. Um, but like yeah. said, BC, Ontario and a few others do it. If I find the, the list, I'll put it up on the screen so you guys can see. It. But just a FYI, a different way of going about it. And for the provincial, you got 600 points like it is now? Yes. Yeah, so uh, for the provincial nominee program, I got 600 points. 
Okay. And um, funny enough, I did not um, go through the Canadian experience class. I came through um, as a federal skill worker. Yeah. You do have the option to either go through the Canadian experience class or the federal skill workers class, whichever you're eligible for, depending right. on yeah. what you do. Yeah. And so guys, I don't think I did a full introduction, but Andrea is a registered Canadian immigration consultant, not no DB DB. So if you need immigration advice, you see it on the screen. Let's connect Global Immigration Consulting Inc. You can reach out to her for immigration questions and she's fairly reasonable. So don't don't bother on the price. We beg. <laughs> Me beg. Aside from that, Andrana, I think a lot of people, now that you've lived in BC and you said you worked mm-hmm. here for five years, I know this, so I'll just say you transitioned to living in Alberta. And I know mm-hmm. people what people want different opinions. So everybody that we'll get on here, we'll get them to talk about um where they live and comparing it. What, what, what are your thoughts? You're the perfect candidate because we know there are places in Vancouver that's very expensive and there are places in Alberta that's very cheap. But how, how would you rate it generally in terms of not only rent, because I know people talk about renting a lot, but like rent, grocery, car, heat bill, hydro, just on a, just on a more high level detailed breakdown of your comparison. So... BC is not Vancouver. <laughs> Thank you. That's just a... <laughs> I, I, That's I love just a... that. I love that because I always said to people, Ontario <laughs> is not Toronto. It's a whole province with like 52 cities. So I love that. Keep going. Yes. Yes. Um, so when I moved, when I lived in BC, I lived in Kelowna, British Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city. A small, beautiful city. Um, when I came here, cost of living was not expensive. Right, it was cheap. However, with the whole immigration and school and stuff, that drove the cost of living through the roof. Um, so while I was there, schools there started um gaining popularity because they have universities there British Columbia there and you mm-hmm. have Okanagan College and so students people start moving their families and stuff cost of living gone through the roof. Um now it's very expensive to live in BC. It's manageable. It's manageable if you're if you're coming as a family but as a single person it's 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 a little bit um expensive. Um however for healthcare if you're coming to BC for healthcare, um, there are opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities. If you're coming to study in healthcare, there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, you, you you can consider BC because it's more of a retirement um, mm. problem. They have a lot right? of like so now that even express entry, the new tier system added nurse aides. So the personal yes. support workers and stuff like that, people can come do those courses and get their PR, get a lot of money. True. Also, yeah. My cousin was telling me there is travel PSWs now, similar to travel nurse, because of the low oh, really? off. So oh, what okay. that means is more opportunities, even in BC, to work at multiple different places. Yes, 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 yes. Um BC, um, compared to Alberta now, the weather is um better in BC. It's not, it doesn't get very cold there. Um, the highest I've ever or the lowest I've ever seen it gone is minus 20, 21 thereabout. Um, Alberta goes up to minus 40 sometimes. So um that is what I miss about BC. Um, because where I was at the time, it was a very small um city, Kelowna, a very small city. We had a community there, everybody knew everybody, right? Um, so that helped a lot. Low, you know, people coming in from your country, you know, you can either share food or, you know, or you get somebody to do you here because that is very right. important. There's people. Very <laughs> important. My cousin did mine, but it's very yes. important. It's very important. Yeah, so you kind of you, you kind of have a community and so that helps you to feel more um at home and help you with the adaptability because you'll yeah. go to a foreign country and you you may you may struggle because you don't have familiar things right or familiar people and so 
with BC, that's what I found. I had a community. Everybody knew everybody. I could jump into the grocery, the Caribbean grocery shop, um, store and the, the gentleman would know me by name, you know, mm. and, and stuff like that. So that is that that was good. Love driving there on the roads, hate driving in, in, in Calgary. And <laughs> everything was close in BC. I could, you know, yeah, going to work, everything was fairly close here. Most times, 30 minutes or more to get to certain areas in, wow. in Calgary. So when we talk about cost of living being expensive there in, in um as opposed to in Alberta, are we talking about only rent tax. or oh, tax? So we're talking about tax, we're talking about rent, and we talk about the only thing that is a little bit better is insurance because BC has a monopoly for insurance. Mm -hmm. And you do after every year your insurance goes down for BC. Right. But um, food, we don't have a lot of the, the food, we pay two taxes for food, uh, but it's not a lot of diversity, diversity with the food in Calgary because it's so huge, you have, you can go just about any store and find something I'm from Jamaica, so you can find something Jamaican, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I I, am, I I imagine other people can see the same So in um, you couldn't find the food but in Alberta you can you could find the food, but it would it would be a little bit expensive and it would have to be outsourced. So in Calgary here right now, um, if I want a piece of yellow, I have to put in a little chicken foot soup. You know, I can run go along to the shop <laughs> to get the piece of yellow yam, right? right. I want to see for a call to find out if they have it because they almost always have it, right? Okay. Um, in BC, now I have to call to our grocery um store person. Jack, you're getting, you're getting a yam. Jack, you're getting a cheese. Jack, you're getting a this. Jack say, they're coming about it done. <laughs> <laughs> all right that was good so what about so you said car insurance is a little bit cheaper um yeah in bc what about and it goes down so it's the same for us in ontario every year we pay less for two cars because we don't live in the city and we don't live in toronto for two that cars, is yeah a lot less we pay 250 for the two cars um and for my one car here pay to um 240 something for one for one and that's in okay what about because I've, I've been reading and when it's really cold like the other day you guys have like a freezing whatever oh, snap. Mm -hmm. what's your heat been like okay comparing winters and summers when i came here i moved here in the winter and when i got my first bill i asked my husband what why 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 did we choose to move it was so cold and i was so cheap at the time I said to my husband, you know, I'm not turning on any heat enough because I cannot afford to pay $300 a month. Not Well, not afford, but I don't want to pay $300 right. a month for, 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 right. for utilities. I, can't, I remember I came home one day and I had to put on two pajamas. We have to open the oven, turn on the stove, anything heat. <laughs> we had to do what? that. And I said, I said, I'm not that near cold. I'm not that near cold. I, I'm going to have to pay the bill. So that was the, sh the biggest shock for me. When I'm in BC, I pay my utilities every two months. And we were looking at maybe $100 or $70. But when I moved here in um in Calgary and the first bill I got, I remember when I was coming, I asked the person that I was, um the place I was moving to, what, what's utility like? And then, oh, no, it's just um, yeah, maybe $170. It was a reasonable. Mm -hmm. But they didn't tell me it every month. Oh, so that's a difference. Yeah. Every month you have to pay. So utilities, um, I have seen um other, because I do, I work in finance and I have the opportunity to see other people's, you know, not, like I do financial planning. So I will see like their costs, right? Their expenses. And I see people budgeting $800. So the size of the house and everything determines the, your cost for utility and also the company. Because we hear um, in BC, most companies in BC are monopoly. So in BC, you have Fortis, BC that takes care of all the hydro and stuff like that. Here, you have different companies. And I pay more tax when I come here in Calgary. Income tax. Yeah. In BC, because we pay two taxes when we, so it was 12%, 7%. We pay PST for five and then GST for seven, somewhere there about. Yeah. Um, so we only pay GST here for 5%. Yeah, so I think that's the difference where in BC and Ontario, we pay higher sales tax. So like if we're buying something, um, yeah. so we pay 13 and 12%, but our income yeah. tax, the, the, the percentage start rate is lower. So we have 12 no. lowest ones at 5%. But I know yeah. that's high, even if you come as a student and you're making $1,000, you're paying 10% of that 
thousand dollars. Yeah, we pay. I pay every year. I have the same. I ask myself. I pay a lot in mm-hmm. um in taxes, especially income taxes. I do pay a lot, especially. So they take if you're in back. a certain income bracket. Right. So they take it out back anyway, take it. So even the say even of the sales tax and 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 I guess that's one of the things that I always encourage people is go where you're comfortable and go where it works for you in terms of jobs, yes. opportunities. Yes. Because when you balance everything right across the board in Canada, the cost of living might look the same. Because if they're taking it out from your taxes, but then the sales is a little bit higher. We are all balanced. Um so yeah. If, yeah. yeah goes down to which province will be cheaper for you to not only live but to transition as a citizen or a permanent resident and which where you have the jobs like where you'll get your job even people can go to bc because that's where it would work for them if you're in tech or whatever um but that goes to show i i appreciate the feedback where this is concerned so my choice of coming to Alberta, one was I wanted to be have access to a quick flight out of Canada. Because in BC, I had to take sometimes three flights. Mm. I don't know if you know about, if you love traveling, but me, I don't want to stay on the plane very long. So mm-hmm. what that was one of the things for me. When I moved here, I could fly over to Florida quick, quick to see my mommy. Or I could jump on a, a straight flight to Jamaica. This should not be one of the main decision makers, but that was it for me. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the reasons for me and my husband at the time was working in the oil field. And so he would travel home every, you know, work 14, travel home every seven days. And mm-hmm. I said, um, if he was in um, Edmonton or, or Calgary at the time, he had the opportunity to, to be home more often. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, that, and great. then I, I wanted diversity, diversity and opportunity. When I lived in Kelowna, I was the only black person working in the office that I worked. Good to know. But in Calgary, it's diverse because I've heard about other places like Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, and those other places in Alberta that's purely one-sided and it, there's not a lot of people that look like us there. I've been to Montreal and Ontario and that's it. But it's a pretty great mix. Like I've never been the only black person. Um, At my company, there's there was two of us and they hired a couple more. I was living in Toronto and where I live now, we're close to, not very that close, but we're close to where they have farms. And so the farm workers are there. And so I'll get to see Jamaicans from time to time. Yes, uh, yes. yeah. And I, and I like that. I like to be away, but not so much away because I'm away from the city. It's a bit more laid back. I'm from the country. So I'm okay with that. So it, it's good perspective. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. And like I always exactly. tell you, balance is based on your life. Um, And we can't just look at 5% or 10% or 12% sales staff without balancing everything else. So yes, that- exactly. <laughs> yeah, I can't get to go back to BC because I love the mountains. I love the wineries and I love the, the whole scenery. It's a beautiful place. However, um, at the time where I was in my life and what I wanted for myself, Calgary was the better place. Not saying I would never move back. But as you say, my choice is um dependent on what I want for me. So while we will see people living in certain places, you know, and showing certain things, you have to ensure that it's it's what you want and not what somebody has. Because right. at the end of the day, when we flip that switch, you go there, you say, oh, shoot. Right? You don't want to make that decision. No. Yeah. So it's very important that you make a decision based on facts. Do your research and then it will fare out better in the end. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why we decided to do this series so that um, there's a lot of things that float online. And there's a lot of hidden truth. And so we see what we see because we see what we see online. And what we don't see is that somebody will post that they're traveling or they're this and they're that. And we don't see the 50,000 credit card owing. We don't see the owing 20,000 line of credit. And we don't see the bad credits, right? We don't see any of that. What we see is, oh, they're living good. That's, that's what I want to do. And I'll go there because that's where they go. Um, and we want to kind of break that trend of her story is my story or his story is my story. But your story is your story once you come with the right mindset. Um, and mindset is everything. To add to that, don't confuse marketing with reality. Um, you have to be able to differentiate because whenever you're making a decision, it's about your life. 
So you have to do your research. If you if you're not able to do that research, get um, an expert or get somebody with the knowledge to help you to assist you. Don't confuse marketing with reality. And that's where a lot of people go down the rabbit hole after they come. This they start cussing and saying, "What is this?" When you haven't done any research, do your research. Do because anybody can tell you anything. Do your own research where you need help. Then you seek that professional help. But do your own research. I agree so much. So like, I just wanted to recap, guys. Remember, Andriana is an immigration consultant. So feel free to reach out to her if you have questions that you need to ask. You have a lot of services that she offers. And you guys know, I started StudyCan. And we are taking a whole different approach to build a community. And so I'll be coaching you guys on things that you need to do to get accepted to Canada and just the whole transition process. You have me to ask questions. So just feel free to go ahead, follow both of our pages on Instagram, on TikTok. We share a lot of information there as well. And if you need specific help, feel free to book us on our website. But this is a free talking, relaxed, unfiltered, true stories about Canadian immigration. And we'll be posting them throughout the year. So I feel free to comment down below and let us know if there's something that you'd want us to talk about. Because while we'll be taking other persons on the channel to talk, we are going to be talking from time to time about different topics based on comments that we get. And we'll think about doing it live in the future. But for now, comment, let us know, share it with people that you think this might be beneficial. All right. Thank you guys for listening. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you, Sanjay, for having me. Um, I look forward to doing more Unfiltered and um, sharing our experiences. Join us to learn more about Canada and um, about what happens behind the scenes. So life after studying, life after PR, life after citizenship. We will be talking all about that. So join us and share your thoughts as well and your views and, of course, your questions. Yeah, you'll get to know us a little bit better. Bye for now. Toodles. Bye.